for the first time ever, CrimeCon, the world's number one true crime event, is going international. CrimeCon UK will take place in London this September 25th and 26th. The weekend will be filled with true crime presentations and experiences from leading criminologists, families and survivors, forensic experts, journalists, celebrities from the true crime world, and more. You'll also have the chance to meet all your favorite true crime podcasters on CrimeCon's podcast row. I'll be there to hang out with you, answer questions, and talk true crime. CrimeCon is the ultimate true crime weekend partnered by Crime & Investigation. You won't want to miss it, so hit up your best true crime friends and plan for a great weekend of true crime on September 25th and 26th in London. To join me at CrimeCon UK, go to crimecon.co.uk. When you register, use my offer code onceupon21 to get 10% off your tickets. That's crimecon.co.uk. And use offer code onceupon21 to get 10% off your ticket, and I'll see you there. This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. We're in the series Getting Away with Murder, where I share cases of people who were clearly at fault for the death of another, but nevertheless, were not deemed criminally responsible. This case regarding the tragic death of an up-and-coming designer in 1966 came to my attention last year, and I was very keen to bring it to my listeners. Luckily, it fits perfectly into this month's topic. 35 years after the case was closed by the police, a journalist decided to reinvestigate to determine if the death that had been deemed a freak accident was truly an accident at all. Not only is this story fascinating, but once again this month, it is also the subject of breaking news. Just this week, another revelation came to light that may change what everyone thought about this case and may solve the mystery once and for all. And I get to share it all with you in this episode. Let's dive into the second chapter in the series, Getting Away with Murder, to ponder the question, should billionaire heiress Doris Duke have been charged with the murder of her friend and designer, Eduardo Torella. Doris Duke was born rich, and not just rich, but richy rich rich. Throughout her life, she had access to the type of wealth that most of us couldn't even begin to imagine. She started out vastly wealthy, and through shrewd investments, increased her wealth fourfold during her lifetime. Doris Duke would give away millions through her charitable foundation to fund good works such as AIDS research, children's organizations, education, the performing arts, and groups that work to protect wildlife and the prevention of cruelty to animals. But as much good as her vast fortune did for the world, it also created much unhappiness for Duke personally. Beginning at the age of 13, when she lost her father and became largely responsible for his fortune. Doris Duke was born in Manhattan on November 22, 1912. Her father, James Duke, had inherited the family farm from his own father, who'd begun tilling the fertile North Carolina soil to grow tobacco at the end of the Civil War. Tobacco crops, as you may imagine, were highly profitable, and James Duke became a very wealthy man after forming the American Tobacco Company in 1890. He would later also go on to found the Duke Power Company in Charlotte, North Carolina. Doris's father was also involved in philanthropy, giving a $40 million endowment to Trinity College in Durham, North Carolina. The school, to honor its benefactor, would be renamed Duke University. James Duke was twice married, but his first marriage lasted only two years and produced no children. Doris was the only child of James and second wife, Nanaline. When her father died of pneumonia in 1925, Doris was just 12 years old. It was to his daughter that James Duke left the bulk of his fortune, reportedly around $100 million, or approximately $1.5 billion in today's dollars. James Duke left his daughter one piece of advice before he died. Trust no one, he reportedly told the 12-year-old while on his deathbed. 
This statement would remain at the forefront of her mind as she became responsible to preserve the family fortune and her father's legacy. Doris was a shy and somewhat awkward child. She was always taller than other children her age and would reach her full height of six feet tall while still in her teens. She would be called the richest little girl in the world by the press. The public clamored for stories about the wealthy and powerful, and reporters and photographers competed to fill newspaper columns with any information on the young heiress. Never comfortable in the spotlight, Doris would avoid the press all her life, and never enjoyed it. Her father's will had provided generously for his wife and his charitable foundation, but Doris was made the heir apparent of his estate. However, there was some ambiguity regarding the Duke's various properties. A 2,700-acre estate in Hillsborough Township, New Jersey called Duke Farms, an East 78th Street Manhattan townhouse, and a 49-room mansion in Newport, Rhode Island called Rough Point, among others. One clause in James Duke's will stated that all properties, quote, go for life to Mrs. Duke, but another clause directed executors that all residences belonging to the estate would be sold at auction, quote, subject to the widow's interest, but the daughter, meaning Doris, was permitted to buy them and was to be given a sufficient sum from the estate with which to purchase them. Later, it would be widely reported that Doris had to sue her mother to keep her from selling off the family assets, but the lawsuit was, in effect, a formality that had to be filed with the court due to the less-than-clear intentions Duke left in his will about who would retain ownership of the family's residences. Doris agreed that her mother should be allowed to live in the residences as long as she wished, and they should not be put up for sale. But the lawsuit was necessary to clear up the matter with a legal guardian appointed to represent 14-year-old Doris. Doris and her mother, by some accounts, may have had a strained relationship later on, but this, more likely, was due to the fact that Nanaline pushed her shy and socially awkward daughter to become a debutante. At the age of 18, Doris, who preferred books and outdoor sports to formal balls, was formally presented to New York Society at a debutante ball held at the family's Rough Point mansion. She was keen on enrolling in college, but her mother discouraged it. Instead, she took Doris on a months-long grand tour of Europe. While in London, it was arranged for Doris to be presented to the Queen at Buckingham Palace. While Doris had not been thrilled to undertake the journey with her mother, it did, however, at least have one benefit. Doris saw art from around the world and would soon begin an impressive art collection of her own. In 1945, at the age of 22, the public was taken by surprise when Doris Duke married James Jimmy Cromwell. Cromwell's first wife had also been an only daughter and an heiress. Delphine Ione Dodge was an heir to the Dodge Motor Company, co-founded by her father, Horace Dodge. It's been said that Doris married young in order to escape being under her mother's watch but her husband had political aspirations that, for a time, Doris also shared. They were both supporters of Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. They began their life together on a two-year around-the-world honeymoon. Cromwell wrote a check to cover some of their travel expenses, but it bounced, and Doris was left to foot the bill. When the couple returned to the States, they moved into a home in Hawaii that Duke had built for them. She named it Shangri-La. It was common knowledge that Doris financed her husband's political ambitions. This paid off in 1940, when Cromwell was appointed as the United States Ambassador to Canada, a position he held for less than five months, when he resigned in order to run for United States Senator of New Jersey. He lost that election and had become increasingly irritated while campaigning that the press was more interested in his socialite wife than his political platform. Tension grew between the couple. They had already begun to live apart when Cromwell was away in Canada, and Doris decided she preferred to stay in Hawaii, where the weather was warm and the press was less intrusive into her personal life. They were living apart most of the year by the time of his failed Senate run, and for all intents and purposes, separated completely by 1943. Finally, after a long, drawn-out legal battle, Doris's marriage ended in divorce in 1948. But Doris continued to make headlines when the press learned that while she was separated from Cromwell, she'd already begun dating other men. It appears that, for the first time, at the young age of 25 or so, Doris was living as an independent woman. No longer under the thumb of her mother or a husband for the first time, she began to sow her wild oats. Doris had a series of lovers, according to media accounts. So in 1940, with Cromwell still in Canada, it was a public scandal 
when Doris gave birth to a baby girl. Her daughter was born prematurely on July 9th of 1940, but the baby girl Doris named Arden did not survive more than a day. Doris was told by doctors that she could no longer conceive a child. She was grief-stricken and began consulting with psychics in order to connect with her dead child. The paternity of the child would forever be in question. After her marriage ended, Doris occupied her time collecting a menagerie of pets and exotic animals that she cared for in her compound in Honolulu. She also studied opera singing, became the first non-Hawaiian woman to become a competitive surfer, worked as a hostess at a military canteen in Egypt during World War II, and traveled the world collecting artworks. She was especially interested in Southeast Asian and Islamic art. She had a short career as a foreign correspondent for the International News Service, reporting from various war-torn cities in Europe. After the war ended, she continued writing as a contributor to Harper's Bazaar while living in Paris. While living in the City of Light, Doris met 36-year-old Porfirio Ruby Rosa, a Dominican diplomat and international playboy. Ruby Rosa reportedly had affairs with some of the world's most beautiful and celebrated women at that time, including Dolores Del Rio, Marilyn Monroe, Ava Gardner, Rita Hayworth, Veronica Lake, Judy Garland, Joan Crawford, and Kim Novak. He met 32-year-old Doris in 1945, and by 1947, they were wed. Doris was in love with the handsome playboy, but her lawyers were quick to realize a possible grifter when they saw one. They arrived on September 1, 1947, with a binding prenuptial agreement in hand, which they insisted that Ruby Rosa sign in order to protect the Duke fortune. Ruby Rosa was angry at first, but after becoming drunk, he signed the legal paperwork before passing out. Big boy passed out in my arms, the smitten Doris would later write. Ruby Rosa was used to betting hundreds of women on a whim. Doris's zest for life, and of course her great wealth, drew him to her, Ruby Rosa would later say, but her neediness and possessiveness towards him, along with his extramarital sexual exploits, would end their marriage within two years. Doris would never marry again, and would continue to hold the torch for her ex-husband. Ruby Rosa would add salt to the wound when two years after his divorce to Doris was finalized, he would wed another heiress, Barbara Hutton. Hutton was heir to the Woolworth fortune and Doris's arch rival. Doris and Barbara were often linked by the media who dubbed the two socialites the Gold Dust Twins. Hutton, a charismatic extrovert, courted public attention, while Duke, an introvert who some characterize as plain and serious, avoided the limelight. Duke resented her comparison to the more personable Hutton. Ruby Rosa made out financially from both of these marriages, first walking away from his marriage to Duke with $25,000 per year in alimony until he remarried, a collection of sports cars, a used B-25 bomber, and a 17th century villa in Paris. After his one-year marriage to Barbara Hutton ended, Ruby Rosa retained possession of another B-25, polo ponies, a coffee plantation in the Dominican Republic, and reportedly $2.5 million. Hey, how's your summer going? Have you had enough you time? Well, I can tell you producing this podcast doesn't give me a lot of downtime. But now and again, I just need a few moments to disconnect from researching, writing, and recording crime cases. Even when I only have a few minutes, I like to spend my me time playing the super fun match three puzzle game, Best Fiends. Best Fiends is the casual mobile puzzle game that I can play anytime for free, right from my phone or tablet, without having to worry about using my data or finding Wi-Fi. With over 100 million downloads, it's the match three puzzle game everyone is talking about. I love that the puzzles are updated all the time, sometimes with special themes and new challenges so I never get bored. I'm currently working to crack level 300, my goal for the end of this month. I find myself playing during my wind down time at the end of the day or whenever I have a moment and I'm looking for something fun to do. Best Fiends is free to download so you can start solving puzzles right away too. There are tons of cute fiendish characters to collect. Let's see, some of my favorites are Quincy with all the eyeballs, Vega with the eyelashes, and Pop, who looks like some kind of a sea urchin. What are yours? Don't know what I'm talking about? Well, you gotta come join us and play Best Fiends. Download the five-star rated puzzle game Best Fiends free today on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends.
Doris Duke, now and forever after single and with enough money to do anything she pleased, spent her time traveling around the world collecting art and antiques, even purchasing her own aircraft to do so, a Boeing 737 jet. She also used it to travel to exotic locales and for convenient transportation between her numerous homes. She'd also purchased and completely remodeled a 14-acre Bel Air estate called Falcon Lair that had once been owned by Rudolph Valentino. Duke became friends with the actress Sharon Tate, who also lived in the neighborhood. During her time in Los Angeles, Duke surrounded herself with a group of interesting and famous friends. At one time or another, she would play hostess to company as varied as Imelda Marcos and Michael Jackson. Running in Hollywood circles, Doris Duke was rumored to have had affairs with Errol Flynn and a young Marlon Brando. After the death of her infant daughter, Duke would become interested in the supernatural and would consult psychics and mystics and also sought out spiritual teachers and practitioners. Perhaps as a result of her second husband's string of infidelities, Duke became possessive and controlling not only over her boyfriends and lovers, but also of her friends and even employees. She expected everyone's absolute loyalty and dedication to her, but her neediness often drove some to ultimately avoid her. When Doris felt abandoned, she would become vindictive, cutting off people abruptly. One of her go-to moves to get back for these perceived betrayals was to threaten or actually file a lawsuit for one reason or another. In her lifetime, Doris Duke would file over 40 lawsuits. She was also paranoid about her privacy. Duke oversaw a staff of more than 200 people to caretake and manage her homes, social calendar, charitable organizations, and personal needs. Each one was under strict orders never to speak to the press. When personnel left her employ, she would threaten and downright bully those who she believed, correctly or not, would betray these confidences. Duke even took to hiring retired FBI agents and other law enforcement personnel to report on the movements of friends and lovers who she thought might talk. She would use her security personnel as a way to intimidate her former friends into silence. Around her 40th birthday, Doris Duke met Joseph Joe Armand Castro, a 25-year-old jazz pianist. He was critically acclaimed as a musician playing in Manhattan's top jazz clubs before he moved to the West Coast. He and Doris began a torrid affair, but one filled with booze, drugs, infidelities, and violence. Even so, they remained together in their on-again, off-again volatile relationship for over a decade. When they were together, Castro lived with Duke at Falcon's Lair, which he sometimes bragged she'd bought for him. Duke would equip a state-of-the-art recording studio at Falcon's Lair. She and Castro also launched a record label, Clover Records, as well as a music publishing company, which they named Joe Doe, a combination of their two first names. Jazz great and orchestra leader Duke Ellington would sign on as a silent partner. Of course, these companies were formed primarily for the benefit of Joe Castro's music career, but Doris had been a longtime jazz music fan and even played a little jazz piano herself. She was also a trained singer in opera, jazz, and gospel. Many recording sessions with other jazz artists were held at the Falcon's Lair studio, but only one of Castro's albums was ever released on the Clover label. Many of these jam sessions by Castro and others recorded on high-quality equipment remain unreleased to this day. Just a few short years later, the label folded. One problem was the amount of alcohol and barbiturates the couple reportedly indulged in during that time. The other was that Doris became jealous of the attention her younger lover received from admiring fans. She and Castro would get into violent fights while under the influence. During one of these arguments in 1963, she would attack Castro with a butcher knife, slashing his arm. No charges were filed against Duke for this attack, but a few months later, after she threw him out of the house on New Year's Day, Castro would file three lawsuits, one charging her with assault and battery, and claiming that he'd been left with a permanent scar and unable to work. The lawsuit asked for damages in the amount of $150,000. Duke's attorneys were able to persuade Castro to drop the suit, and she persuaded him to get back together with her bribing him with the new recording studio and a $100,000 car. What kind of car cost $100,000 in the mid-1960s, I wonder? If you know, shoot me a message on Facebook or Twitter. But the following year, Doris fell into a deep depression after learning that her ex-husband, Porfirio Ruby Rosa, had been killed in an automobile accident, crashing his Ferrari into a tree outside of Paris. He'd been celebrating a win on the polo fields that day with an all-night celebration at a Paris nightclub. 
The 56-year-old had died doing two of the things he'd love most, playing polo and racing cars. Doris Duke was prone to depression, and Ruby Rosa's tragic death sent her into a spiral. Castro and Duke, whose relationship was already on the rocks, began spending more time apart. Castro began an affair at this time with another woman, a young singer who was performing with his jazz trio. Doris, still battling depression, began depending on a platonic friend, a young man named Eduardo Torella, for emotional support. Torella was a talented interior designer. He'd met Duke eight years earlier, and she had quickly employed him as her personal designer for her homes in Honolulu, New Jersey, Los Angeles, and Newport, Rhode Island. He'd also become a close friend and confidant. The relationship between Doris and Joe Castro came to a dramatic end in May of 1966. Doris found out about the affair Castro had been carrying on with the singer, and they got into a violent fight. When the dust settled, the kitchen at Falcon's Lair lay in ruins, and Doris reportedly was left with a broken jaw. Castro wrote only one line in his diary that he kept faithfully. About that night, he scrawled, quote, it was finished. The next day, Doris Duke left Los Angeles to live full-time in her Newport, Rhode Island home, taking Ed Torella with her. Eduardo Eddie Torella had been employed by Doris Duke as her interior designer for almost eight years by the spring of 1966. Torella was a very talented designer and had become in demand in Hollywood. He was ready to branch out as a full-time set designer and make his home permanently in Los Angeles, but first he had to break the news to Doris. This was not a prospect he relished, given how attached she'd become and how much she depended on him. She sought out his advice on all her home furnishings and decor, and also trusted his opinion about antiques and art, consulting him before acquiring each piece. Duke also relied on Torella for friendship and emotional support. He'd been there during the worst times in her 12-year relationship with Joe Castro. Ed Torella was born in 1924 in Morris County, New Jersey. He'd been a performer in New Jersey nightclubs as a young man, where he'd run in the same circles as Frank Sinatra. When the war began, he enlisted in the Army and fought in the Battle of the Bulge, earning a Bronze Star. Upon returning to the States, Torella took a job managing the millinery department at Saks Department Store. He fashioned some of the most elaborate hats worn by New York's social set. Two of his clients were gossip mavens Hedda Hopper and Luella Parsons. Torella always had an eye not only for fashion but also interior design. He had impeccable taste and became a sought-after designer for the wealthy and well-connected in both New York and Los Angeles. Torella refurbished the Los Angeles home of singer Peggy Lee and also designed Elizabeth Taylor's oceanfront home. Torella shared two California homes with his boyfriend, Edmund Cara, a prominent sculptor. They split their time between their Laurel Canyon home and another in Big Sur. Torella and Cara loved to entertain and their home was often filled with artists, actors, and musicians. Frequent guests included Dennis Hopper, Kim Novak, and Sharon Tate, who was a close friend. Torella had spent years designing Duke's numerous homes, but was now more interested in pursuing set design. Cara had sculpted a bust of Elizabeth Taylor that was used in the film The Sandpiper, and Torella was hired as the film's technical director and even had a small part in the movie in a scene with Charles Bronson. Like other friends and lovers in her past, Duke became possessive of Torella and jealous of the attention he was receiving from others who also recognized his talent. Even though she kept Torella close and depended on his design expertise almost exclusively, Duke nevertheless underpaid him while monopolizing most of his time. When she saw how in demand he was becoming in Hollywood, she insisted that he return with her to Newport, using her terrible breakup with Joe Castro to emotionally manipulate him to leave L.A. and remain by her side. Torella's second credit for set design was on a Tony Curtis film titled Don't Make Waves. It also starred his friend Sharon Tate. With his career taking off, he decided to finally make a break with Doris Duke and move to Los Angeles full-time. Duke had become even more unstable after her breakup with Castro and returned to Rough Point. She had frequent emotional outbursts and mood swings, and she often took her anger out on her friends, including Torella. In late September 1966, Ed Torella told his partner and family that he was planning on a trip to the East Coast to help Duke with one last acquisition, an antique bust from the 15th or 16th century, said to depict St. Ursula. 
In fact, the sculpture was said to contain a bone from the martyred saint herself. The piece had been restored by a Newport area art dealer and put up for sale. Duke was interested in acquiring it for her collection, but wanted it appraised first. She wanted Torella to accompany her for this job. He agreed to fly out and help her for two reasons. First, because he needed the money for some expensive dental work that he had scheduled to have done, and also because it would give him an opportunity to let Duke know face-to-face that he could no longer work for her. He was cautioned by both Kara and several of his family members not to go. Having been told of Duke's infamous temper and learning that she had once stabbed her boyfriend during a fight, they were concerned for his safety. But he told them he could handle Duke. After all, he'd known her for years. And while she might get angry and make a scene, he didn't believe that she would ever be a threat to him. Torella flew to the East Coast and rented a Dodge station wagon outside of the airport. He planned to drive it to Rough Point, Duke's mansion in Newport, Rhode Island, and spend one night there. The next day, he would go with Doris to view the bust of St. Ursula, return to Rough Point to pack up some belongings he had stored there, and then drive to his family's home in New Jersey before flying home to California. With his itinerary set, Eduardo Torella arrived at Rough Point on Thursday, October 6th. Within 24 hours, the 42-year-old would be dead. So this is the part of the story that I need to explain a couple of different ways for you to get the complete picture. First, I'll tell you what was reported back in 1966 when the incident occurred and what the outcome of the investigation was. Second, I'll tell you what others were saying about it at that time and why it appeared that the real story may have been covered up, or at least glossed over. Finally, I'll bring you up to date with a new investigation that was started last year in 2020, and what we know now. We left off on Thursday, October 6, with Eddie Torella arriving in Newport, Rhode Island, to stay overnight with Doris Duke at her 10-acre estate, located at what was called Millionaire's Row in Newport. The 49-room Tudor-style mansion, located at 680 Bellevue Avenue, was located at the end of a long circular drive, protected behind a set of enormous wrought iron gates. Newport's Cliff Walk, a a three-and-a-half-mile walking trail, was located at the edge of Rough Point's expansive backyard. The mansion boasted panoramic views of the Atlantic Ocean. Around 5 p.m. on Friday, October 7th, Duke and Torella got into his rented Dodge station wagon and drove away from the house together. It was reported that they were headed out for a dinner reservation But later that was clarified, because in fact they had already eaten a light meal at home and were actually on their way to meet the antique dealer in Newport. This was the last job Torella planned to do for Doris Duke. He had served as her interior designer as well as her art curator for several years. He agreed to give her his opinion on the St. Ursula sculpture before returning to Rough Point to pack and head to see his family in New Jersey. After that, he would be flying back to California after having given Doris his resignation notice in person. Torella, now behind the steering wheel, drove the large station wagon down the long driveway away from Rough Point. Approaching the 15-foot-high, 20-foot-wide wrought iron gates, he stopped the car about 15 feet from them. He then got out of the vehicle in order to manually open the gates so he could drive through. So first I'm going to take you through quickly of the official account of what happened next from the 1966 investigation. So after Eduardo Torella stopped the car in front of the gates and got out to unlock the chain that held them closed, Doris Duke slid into the driver's seat, released the parking brake, shifted the car into drive, and then hit the accelerator. The two-ton station wagon sped towards Torella, burst through the gates, smashed a fence across the street, and crashed into a tree. Torella's body was crushed under the rear axle of the station wagon. He had massive injuries to his lungs, spinal cord, and brain, and died instantly. And from an official report at that time, the first emergency alarm came in just after 5 p.m. that evening. Quote, received call for auto accident. Woman was hurt. Car went out of control. Man under car. End quote. It also says the 4,000-pound Dodge was so heavy that the power jacks on the ambulance couldn't raise it, so a tow truck was summoned. By 5.40 p.m. in separate vehicles, Doris Duke and the lifeless body of Eduardo Torella were speeding towards Newport Hospital. Doris Duke, news reports said, was taken to the hospital bleeding from head wounds and with cuts to her face as well. It was also reported that she had 30 stitches to her lip and chin. The next morning, Saturday, October 8th, 
The lead story in the Newport Daily News said Newport police this morning refused to indicate when they would question Doris Duke, who was at the wheel of a station wagon that killed her 42-year-old male friend yesterday afternoon. The only witness was Miss Duke, who was admitted to Newport Hospital suffering from facial cuts and severe shock. Her doctor, Philip C. McAllister, was quoted in the New York Daily News saying he doubted Miss Duke knew what had happened, and he called it a freak accident. He explained that they decided to keep investigators and police from questioning her for the time being because, quote, it would have been inhumane to make her recall the tragedy so soon, the doctor said. He was then asked if it could have been anything but an accident. Unthinkable, McAllister replied. I think they were devoted, speaking of Duke and Torella. So the first time that Doris Duke was actually interviewed by police about the incident at all was two days later on Sunday, October 9th. The interview was short and was conducted in her bedroom at Rough Point and in the presence of her New York attorney and her business manager. Lieutenant Frank Walsh took her statement and Detective George Watts was also in attendance. While she was questioned, Duke sat up in her bed with her German shepherds on either side of her. There was only four questions on the transcript of that statement. Duke explained how the accident happened this way. Ed Torella stopped the station wagon 15 feet before the gates and then got out of the driver's seat to open the gates. While he was moving towards the gates, Duke moved over from the passenger seat to the driver's seat to drive the car through the open gates. According to Doris, they did this all the time. Torella would open the gate, she would drive the car through the gates, he would shut them and get back in the car. She said, quote, it was something we'd done a hundred times before. But something happened. Before she had time to react, the car moved forward. Panicking, instead of hitting the brake, she hit the gas. It careened towards Torella, knocking him down, and continued going through the gates, smashing a fence across the street, and then crashing into a tree. The New York Daily News would say that the gate, quote, was hit with such force it sprang open. Police Chief Joseph Raddus would summarize this account for the press the following day, saying that, quote, Torella was crushed against the iron gates and then dragged across Bellevue Avenue and pinned under the car. He called the incident an unfortunate accident and declared the case closed. But the police chief received criticism by the state's attorney general, J. Joseph Nugent, who said that the quickly opened and closed investigation was far from complete. So the chief then announced that the case was still openly being investigated. The following day, another interview with Doris was reportedly held. After that interview, the police department presented a three-page transcript of that interrogation of Duke, which was also held at Rough Point. This second interview was submitted to the attorney general's office and inserted into the record, and then the case was said to finally be closed. On Wednesday, October 12th, just a few days after the accident, the New York Times reported that, quote, The police termed today as definitely an accident the death of Eduardo Torella. That same day, the chief of detectives told the Providence Journal there was no evidence of foul play. But there were other questions, at least by the public, if not by the police. Some people were saying that they believed that Doris Duke was drunk at the time and perhaps was responsible for the accident because she had been driving while drunk. The medical examiner said that tests were conducted and that no alcohol or drugs were present in either Doris Duke or the victim, Eduardo Torella. And yet, still some didn't believe it. And right away, some said that they believed that Doris Duke had gotten away with murder. So a journalist named Peter Lance grew up in Newport, Rhode Island. He started working as a journalist at the Newport Daily News just eight months after Torella died. He went on to become an investigative reporter and also to write books on counterterrorism and organized crime. And he always wanted to know, was Torella's death really an accident? Because he had heard rumors while growing up in the area. So in 2016, something came to the forefront of his mind that pricked at his consciousness enough that he decided that he was going to reinvestigate the case. In 2016, when Donald Trump was running his presidential campaign, A quote that he made stuck out to Peter Lance. It was reported that Trump said, I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and I wouldn't lose any voters. This made Peter Lance think, here is a billionaire, an alleged billionaire, reportedly bragging about getting away with murder. And that made him wonder about the Doris Duke case. The first thing he did was to start to ask residents in the area what they thought. 
and he found out that many who'd been alive at that time believed that Doris Duke had gotten away with murder. So now, as an investigative reporter, he had to know. So he begins his investigation. This is from the article that I read that was released in the summer of 2020, so a year ago, in Vanity Fair. The title of the article is Homicide at Rough Point. And I'm just going to give you highlights from his investigation, and then I will show you how all of this plays out in this case. First of all, he found that there was problems with the investigation from the beginning. Number one, the doctor who made all of the statements to the police about Doris Duke being in shock, not being able to be interviewed right away about her injuries, his name was Dr. Philip McAllister. Dr. McAllister was actually, at that time, the acting state medical examiner. Now he was serving as Duke's personal physician. When did that happen? Lance found out that it was after she entered the emergency room that night. I mean, let's face it, the woman's got a billion or more dollars. So she was able to probably say, hey, I want you to be my doctor and this is what I'll pay you. So that night he becomes her personal physician. And he's also the official medical examiner who's going to be reporting findings to law enforcement about these cases. So obviously a conflict of interest there. When he became her doctor that night in the hospital room, he right away placed her in a secure private room, making it impossible for state investigators to question her that night. What Lance says is, quote, the man legally charged with determining the official cause of death had gone on Doris Duke's payroll. Secondly, Lance was also able to obtain a missing police report, which contained the interviews with Doris Duke. The first statement that was dated 10-9-1966 a.k.a. the bedroom interview, there were four questions total in the transcript. This was the interview afterwards the chief of police told the press that it was an unfortunate accident and the case was closed. Then when the state's attorney wanted a more thorough report on the investigation, according to Peter Lance's investigation, Newport's chief of police, Chief Raddus, contacted Doris Duke's attorney, Aram Arabian, and said he needed more to close out the case. Arabian, Duke's attorney, then told the police to, quote, write something up, and if it was approved by Doris Duke, she would sign it. Okay, this is not an investigation. This is just a glossing over at the minimum. So this three-page transcript of the second interview with Doris Duke was then created. What Lance discovered was that it was fabricated to act as an interview with her. The questions were posed to Duke by the police and also answered by someone that wasn't Doris Duke, either the police or her attorney. Even her birth date was written down wrong, and she actually had to strike it out and initial it when it was corrected. So obviously, she wasn't giving these answers. She wouldn't have given her own birth date wrong. So basically, the second interview was cooked up between police and Doris's attorney in order to just close out the case and be done with it. Peter Lance keeps digging, and he finds the court records from a lawsuit that was filed. There was a lawsuit filed by Torella's family against Doris Duke and also against Avis, the rental car company where Ed Torella had rented the station wagon. In the court filing were interviews with Doris Duke that were entered into court records. And in these statements of Duke's, there were other things that were detailed that were not explained in her first brief interview with police. And this is her statement that's in the record. Quote, Edward Torella drove the automobile up to 12 or 15 feet from the north gate. I was sitting in the passenger seat. He got out to open the gate, which was locked. I moved over to the driver's seat. I put my left foot on the brake and moved the gear shift from park to drive. The car immediately moved forward through the gates and across Bellevue Avenue, where it struck a fence and stopped. I was injured and dazed. I looked around for Mr. Torella. I did not see him. I went back into the house to see if he was there. A man and a woman helped me. Lance found out who this man and woman were and interviewed them as well. These first civilians on the scene were Lewis Tom and his daughter Judith, who were sightseers in the area on that day. Judith also happened to be a nurse for the Navy. They told Lance that they had come upon the car crashed against the tree and observed a woman in the street, quote, walking back and forth, hysterical, end quote. They then began to look around the car for anyone injured. As Judith was looking for any other people that might be hurt, the woman, which of course was Doris Duke, took off, running towards the house. Judith followed her because she wasn't sure if she was also injured or in shock and wanted to see to her as well. She ran after Duke, who ran into the house and up the stairs calling for someone. But then she ran back downstairs and outside. 
Judith continued to try to stop her to see if she was hurt, and Judith would report that she didn't notice any bleeding on Doris, including her face, which she says she got a very good look at. And remember, Dr. McAllister told reporters that Doris Duke had needed 30 stitches to her face and lip. So we know right away, if Judith Tom remembers this correctly, what she believes she does, then Dr. McAllister had to be lying when he said that she needed these stitches. There was also an account in the Newport Daily News the following day that reported that the two strangers had found Doris Duke, quote, bleeding from head cuts. Judith says this is patently untrue. She said she did notice a few bruises and scratches on Doris Duke, but she was not bleeding. And she said she would have remembered that because, remember, she was a nurse and was going to see if she needed any medical attention. Also, Judith Tom said that when Doris came running down the stairs, she heard her say that she'd, quote, run over Ed. But in the Avis court transcript, Duke explained that she'd run into the house, quote, in search of Ed. So if she already knew that she had run over Ed, why would she tell the court that she had gone searching for Ed? So that didn't jibe at all. So the next thing that Lance wanted to find out was, was this an accident or was this deliberate? He talked to the staff who had been at Rough Point at that time, and over the years, he said one theory of the crash had stood out among the help. Some believe that because the estate's iron gates opened inward, Duke, unfamiliar with the rental car, had to put the vehicle in reverse to allow the gates to swing open freely, but in her confusion, had perhaps hit the gas. A man named Johnny Nutt, who was Doris's former gardener, said that other staffers had a different take on the crash. And this is what he knew, and this is what he reported. Quote, Miss Duke and Mr. Torella, he told Peter Lance, had a big argument that night as they left the house. He heard this. Okay, so he personally heard this argument. And that continues, quote, he, meaning Torella, wanted to go back to Hollywood to resume his career. They got in the car. Mr. Torella was driving. He got out to open the gate, but he left it in drive with the emergency brake on. He was going to come back and get in the car, drive it through, and lock it behind him. But for some reason, Miss Duke decided to drive. Then he says this, She was a big woman, a lot taller than he was, and as she slid across the seat to drive it out, her knee hit the brake release. The car jerked forward. She went to slam on the brake, but hit the gas instead. That's the way I heard it, end quote. Lance did a little bit more investigating on this belief that some of the staff had or had heard. And he says that Nutt's explanation is puzzling because it suggests that Torella intended to return to the vehicle and drive it afterwards, after opening the gates. But in Duke's statement, she said that it was routine for her to slide over behind the wheel. She said it was something she'd done a hundred times before. This is the other thing that Lance found out. In many vehicles of that era, the driver engaged the parking brake with his left foot and released by pulling back on it. I had that same thing in uh, a couple of my cars in one of my, uh, an SUV that I used to have. Still, it was difficult to believe, Lance says, that Torello would leave the car in drive and turn his back on her, whether the parking brake was on or not. And then he also found this, doing more research. In fact, Lance says, the owner's manual of the 1966 Dodge Polara clears things up, which is the kind of car they were driving. The parking brake on that model could only be disengaged by pulling a release lever located on the left side of the dashboard by hand. So not only would it have been impossible to release the brake on the floor by foot, but in some Polara models, there was also an optional warning signal that flashed red when the brake was engaged. So that idea that people had about how this was an accident didn't make a lot of sense when you know how this parking brake actually works. Duke stated that when Torella got out to open the gate, quote, I moved over to the driver's seat, I put my left foot on the brake, and moved the gear shift lever from park to drive. Torella's family attorney declared in that suit that, quote, Miss Duke released the brake. Since releasing the brake would have been a conscious act, was it somehow possible that Duke mistook the gas for the brake? That's the question, right? So is this still an accident, even if she did something to physically cause the accident to happen the way it did, but it could still be an accident. So Lance interviewed an ex-detective named James Moss, and he asked him that very question. And the detective said, not likely. Quote, when you consider the size of the brake and accelerator pedals in that model wagon, the brake was horizontal and the gas pedal was vertical. It defies belief that anyone could confuse them. Now, we didn't hear anything about this in the paper, in the reports at the time of the accident. 
Lance says that that conclusion was later confirmed by a state official who appeared on the scene that night. At 10.30 p.m., Louis Perotti, an investigator for the Rhode Island Registry of Motor Vehicles, arrived at the mansion. He said, quote, it was dark. Using a flashlight, I saw tire marks in the driveway gravel inside the gate. He said that he tried to question Doris Duke when she got back from the hospital, but a battery of lawyers had arrived and they wouldn't let us see her. By law, the Motor Vehicle Registry's investigators are supposed to question all drivers in vehicular homicides. But Moss says this, quote, they put us off all day. And then the police said we could be present when they interviewed her that Sunday. But when the detective arrived the following morning for that interview, they were told at the police station that the interview was already in progress. So then they ran to the mansion where the interview was supposedly happening. And when they got there, the interview was just about over. And he said, we were allowed to observe, but we didn't get to ask her any questions. And then Detective Moss says this, quote, it was almost like the fix was already in. Peter Lance found two more things that kind of answer a lot of questions that we would still have about this case. One was he was able to find the official autopsy report of Edward Torella, something that had been lost for decades. And how he found it was it was misfiled in the basement of Rhode Island's medical examiner's office, he said, for 50 years. It was listed under the name Torella Edmund, not Eduardo. You would still think they'd be able to find it. The last name was correct and spelled correctly. So that seems a little sketch to me. The other thing is that he was able to dig up some photographs that weren't in the official record, but had been taken by a photographer for the Newport Daily News, and he still had copies of them in his basement, and he was able to get these photographs from this photographer's relatives. So let's talk about the autopsy report first, just to kind of give a review of how this accident happened. We know that Torella got out of the car and walked to the gates. From Doris Duke's first statement, we also know that Torella had just enough time to reach the lock when the station wagon, quote, leaped forward. The damage to the gates shows that they were struck virtually head on at a point when they were still closed. Because remember, it burst through the gate, gates were broken, all of that. So they weren't open yet. The official autopsy report that he found shows that Torella's injuries were entirely inconsistent with the official theory of the crash. Although Duke had at first told the authorities that Torella, quote, was crushed against the iron gates, the report filed by the pathologist notes that, except for a right hip fracture, all of Torella's other injuries were to his upper body. He sustained zero damage to his legs. So how is that possible? And also, all the damage to the gates, you can see in these photographs that he found, occurred in an area below the level of Torella's waist. So if Doris Duke had crushed him against those gates, as she told police, why were there no injuries to his lower body? One man in the pictures who seems to be there in an official capacity investigating the scene was a detective sergeant named Fred Newton. And Lance knew Fred Newton from his time working for the Newport News. So he talked to Fred Newton and Lance says, I finally learned what he'd learned after I located the first officer who showed up on the scene while Duke was still in the car. The first officer on the scene was a rookie patrolman named Edward Angel. On October 7th, he'd just gone on duty at 5 p.m., and within minutes, the radio on his patrol car said there was an accident. So he was the first one there. And this is what he said. There was a woman inside the vehicle. She was extremely upset. I looked down and found someone underneath the car all rolled up. I was inexperienced and young, so I blurted out, he's under the car. That sent her into shock, Angel says. She jumped out of the car, and thank God there was a young Navy nurse there. Remember, that was Judith Tom. And I asked her if she could help her, and I was focused on whoever was under the vehicle and whether he was still alive. A short while later, after Torella's body was extricated from under the car, Officer Angel pulled out a pad to make a sketch of the scene. And he says this, quote, I walked into the middle of Bellevue Avenue, looked down, and saw some skin and blood. I drew a diagram of what I thought had been the point of impact between the subject and the vehicle, where I thought he'd been run over. In Angel's drawing, the impact, based on the blood and human remains found there, occurred not at the gate, but out on the street. 
The officer's first thought about this was he saw this scene and took note of the evidence that he found there of what had occurred during this accident was that this woman in the car had hit a pedestrian who was crossing the street. He said, I submitted my findings and the next day I got a call by Sergeant Newton. Sergeant Newton then took him back up to the scene and showed me markings on the gates and suggested that somebody had been forced up on the hood of the car. Then he walked me into the middle of Bellevue Avenue, explaining that the blood and the skin I'd found were from where the victim rolled off the car and fell in front of it. According to Officer Angel, Fred Newton at that time believed that Torella went up on the hood of the wagon before it hit the gate. That was his theory of the crash, he says. Then at some point after the gates blew open, Doris Duke hesitated, tapped the brakes, and he rolled off the car. So if you think about it, you drive into somebody, what's their first instinct? If they can do anything, you know, you can't jump out of the way in time. You may jump up to try to get on top of the car so it doesn't run you over. This is what the the investigator believed. And then when she stopped, tapped the brakes, his body rolls off and into the front or the, the front side of the vehicle. But then at that point, Officer Angel says, He was run over by the vehicle and dragged to the point where he was still underneath it when it hit the tree, which is all the way across the other side of the street. Peter Lance then concludes, that would account for why the lower gates were pulverized, but Torella's legs remained undamaged. If Newton was correct, Lance concludes, Doris Duke had killed Torella with intent. See, when I read that part, I thought, whoa, and I even wrote it in the margin, whoa, (laughs) that's crazy. This is all the evidence that he collected and makes a very compelling case that this was done deliberately. So what did he do now? This is, you know, 50 years after the fact. Peter Lance puts all his information together and he gives this evidence he collected to a senior staff engineer with a company called Collision and Injury Dynamics, which is one of the nation's top forensic consulting firms. And this is their conclusion, according to Peter Lance's article. Quote, based on my analysis of Sergeant Newton's own diagrams in the police report, it's clear that Doris Duke was on the accelerator for at least three seconds before the vehicle went through the gates. There is no evidence that Mr. Torella was pinned against them. It's clear that he went up on the hood, fell off, and got run over mid-street. Newton said that this led me to conclude that the event did not occur as described by Doris Duke. But of course, as we know, the chief of police shut the investigation down said it was an accident, case closed, end of sentence. That was it. Here are some of the the last parts of, of that story before I get to the very, very last part of Lance's investigation. There was a lawsuit filed, like I said, by Edward Torella's family. They were actually asking for just $200,000 in damages for the loss of Torella. And she fought it, took it to court, Uh, even though this woman was worth billions. Even if it was an accident, wouldn't you think that she would offer them her sincerest condolences? And if they wanted money, here, I mean, here you go. I feel horrible that this happened. I know it's not going to bring him back, but if it in some way compensates, I'm happy to do it. This is a woman who is making a million dollars. I believe it's a million dollars a day. I could be wrong about that. Maybe it was a week or a month. But anyway, a million dollars every few days or whatever in interest on her fortune. And you can't offer them anything. This just shows you, you know, the kind of indictive nature that they were talking about that Doris Duke had. Anyway, had to take her to court. During the lawsuit, and this was the part that really, to me, was the worst part, her attorneys basically assassinated Edward Torella's character you know, brought up things like, oh, you know, he probably was um, doing drugs and plus he was a homosexual. Plus, you know, remember this is 19, you know, late 1960s, early 1970s and just ridiculous things that he would never have been worth much anyway. I mean, just a lot of crap they brought in that was just disgusting. In the end, the family won the lawsuit and they received a grand total of $75,000. So, you know, come on. That was nothing. She probably had that in her handbag at the time. (music) 
Peter Lance then published a book about this case, about his investigation, about what he found called Homicide at Rough Point. And it was released this summer in 2021. Just last month, on July 3rd, 2021, when Peter Lance was doing a book signing in Newport in the town where this happened, he met a man named Bob Walker. And Bob Walker told him something that corroborates, and not only corroborates, but gives direct testimony about Peter Lance's conclusions, if we believe Bob Walker's account, is exactly what happened. So this just came out. This is what I was talking at the beginning about the breaking news. And this came out again in Vanity Fair. I'm sorry, I'm not, this is not a sponsor, but I have been a longtime subscriber to Vanity Fair. If you guys are not reading their articles, especially their crime articles, I mean, they're amazing. They have amazing writers and reporters and investigators, anything from Menendez to OJ to, I mean, anything. They have amazing reporting on it. So anyway, this just came out August 5th, 2021. So, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, this second article by Peter Lance came out about this case in Vanity Fair. It's called The Doris Duke Cold Case Reopens. The only known eyewitness speaks for the first time. And I could not wait. I couldn't believe it. As I was doing the research for this episode, this came up and I was just finishing the outline for this episode and found this. And I was like, oh my gosh, now I have to bring this in. So this episode is a little bit longer, but you guys are, need to hear this, okay? So he goes into the article. He kind of gives a, a summary of what I just told you and what was in his first article. So he meets this man, this man named Robert Walker, or Bob Walker, comes up to him at this book signing in July. Bob Walker tells him, I just read your book. Not only was your account of the murder 100% consistent with what Fred Newton concluded, but Bob Walker says... I was there. I heard the entire lead up to the crash and I confronted Doris Duke seconds after it. This is when she jumped out of the car and was staring down at it, it meaning the accident. Who is Bob Walker and how was he there? You're, you're not going to believe this. Bob Walker was a paper boy in 1966. He was 13 years old at the time. He's now 68 and retired. But at the time, he was a 13-year-old who was delivering papers for the Newport Daily News on his 10-speed bike. And this is his account of that day, which he claims that he remembers with complete clarity. It was just approaching 5 p.m. when he was on his bike at the corner of Ledge Road, just west of Doris Duke's estate. He was heading to her estate to deliver the Newport Daily News. He would normally slip the paper into the mail slot next to the Rough Point service gate located about 250 feet from the main entrance at 680 Bellevue. He says, quote, I initially heard the argument and screaming of two people. He said back in those days, it was very quiet in this area. There were no cars and no people, no people walking on the road at that time. I was immediately intrigued about what must be going on and I quickened my pace. Turning the corner and pedaling towards the voices, Walker says he heard a series of noises that he later realized, and this also synced with Sergeant Newton's theory about Travella's death. He said, quote, the arguing stopped for a couple of seconds. Now, remember the gardener and other people at the time said that they heard them arguing as they left the house. And this is what Bob Walker is confirming that he also heard arguing. The arguing stopped for a couple of seconds, uh, Walker continues. And the next thing I heard was the roar of a motor, the crash, and the screaming of a man. At that moment, as Bob Walker was getting closer, he heard the man scream yet again. Quote, that proceeded for a couple of seconds, he says, and then there was a deceleration of the motor and a slight skid. And this is what Lance says. That's when, for unknown reasons, Duke and Newton's view as related to Angel had tapped the brakes and Torella rolled off onto Bellevue Avenue, having sustained a broken hip, but still alive. This is what they believe. The boy by now was pedaling furiously, closing in on the rough point service gate when he heard the man, quote, scream again and the roar of the motor, at which point, he says, the man's will, quote, turned to horror. He heard him say, no. It was then that Sergeant Newton concluded, according to Angel, that Doris Duke hit the accelerator and drove forward, crushing Torella under the wheels, dragging him across the street jumping the opposite curb and knocking down a section of a post and rail fence and then ending up against the tree. And then Lance concludes, if this account is accurate, what paperboy Bob Walker had heard was Eduardo Torella's last spoken word, perhaps a plea for mercy as he realized he was about to be run over. Bob Walker was there when this happened. He didn't see it. He heard it. 
but seconds later, he was on the scene. He said, I looked left about 250 feet down the block to the crash site, and I encountered something startling. I saw a woman getting out of the car. She was a rather tall woman. When she got out, she took like six or seven steps, quick and deliberate. She then spun around looking at the car. Now, remember, when some people said they found her, she was still sitting in the car. When the nurse and her father came along, they said she was still sitting in the car. But Bob Walker says she got out of the car and she was looking, she was going around the car to where the side that Ed Torella was run over and under the car. Bob Walker didn't see anybody at the time. He just saw her. Walker then said he approached her on his bike from behind. He watched as the tall woman, quote, just froze there looking down, very deliberate. She was like that the whole time it took me to go from the service gate. Now steam was coming out of the motor and she's just standing there doing nothing looking down at the bottom of the car. At that point, it appears that Duke and Bob Walker were the only people out on the street. Then the article goes on to say, then Duke heard the click, click, click of the gears of the bike. As Walker came up behind her, he says, quote, she spun around and looked at me. I said, can I help you, ma'am? And she said, screaming and pointing her finger, you better get the hell out of here. I was a little taken aback, Walker recounts. There was a car in the steam, so I started to go around the car and she started ghosting me. Now, it's funny because I was like, what? Ghosting me? But this is what he explained. He imitates Doris Duke kind of doing a crab walk back and forth that he says prevented him from looking under the vehicle. Now, the way I picture this is he's, you know, kind of walking sideways along the side of the car from a few feet away, trying to look around the front of the car and may, or maybe to the back of the car. And Doris Duke gets between him and the car, and she's kind of like sidestepping back and forth. Like I can just see like with her hands up, you know, like you said, like a crab, like back and forth, like trying to like, when you don't want somebody to like go past you, like if you're playing a game or something, I mean, that's just a bizarre scene. I could not get that out of my head that she's in her heels, in her, probably her little, you know, her skirt or whatever. And she's like crab walking back and forth to, to block this kid from seeing anything. I mean, amazing, right? That's just, to me, was just insane. He says that prevented him from looking under the vehicle. Of course, we know that Terrell's body was wedged under there. Twice more, Walker says he offered to go for help. And in an increasingly louder voice, Duke bellowed at him. Finally, as he got closer to the back of the station wagon, she screamed, get out of here now. At that point, shaken, he left the scene to finish his paper route. Thinking back to how the woman had loomed over him, he remembered that she appeared to be uninjured. She didn't have a scratch on her face, he maintained. If she had, I would have been even more insistent to go for help. Now you'll say, okay, he saw this. So what happened? Why didn't he say anything? How come people didn't know this? Or did he tell somebody and they just not do anything about it? Like minutes after that is when the Ricky cop showed up and, you know, we got his account now. He said he also found Doris inside the vehicle. Oh, here's the other little point that just blows my mind. I guess there's more of this information in Homicide at Rough Point in Lance's book, which I definitely will be picking up because there's more details here that it seems are not in these shorter articles. So Sergeant Angel said he had found Doris inside the vehicle and reported that she was bleeding from the mouth from what another officer later described as, quote, steering wheel injuries. Now we got to wonder, did she del do this to herself deliberately? Did she like bang her head on the steering wheel or on console or something to cause some bruises, you know, something to make it look like it was an accident and she got hurt as well. This is what to know about Bob Walker, just to finish this up. He did go home. He goes, I had to finish my paper route, but I was going as fast as I can so I can get back home and let my dad know what had happened because he didn't see a body. He didn't see anybody. He just saw her. So he was like, thought it was weird. But he, when he got home finally to tell his father, he said, first of all, my dad put me off. He's like, go wash up for dinner. You know, he didn't get to tell his dad that night. So the next morning he had to get up, go to school. That afternoon after school, he went to go pick up his papers again to do his paper route again. And he saw the headline of what had happened. His headline that just floored him said, quote, Doris Duke kills friend in crash. He saw the picture of the car that he had seen crash into the fence. He said, I just sat there reading it and I was stunned. Eduardo Torella, that was the man I'd heard screaming because he thought about it later that night and he thought, wait a minute, I thought I heard two voices arguing, but I only saw a woman. So that was his first question to himself. And then when he saw this headline, he said, that was the man I'd heard screaming, only they got it all wrong. The story said he was crushed against the iron gates, which was a lie. 
It also said she was admitted to Newport Hospital suffering from facial cuts and severe shock, and I knew that was also a lie. When he got home, he handed the paper to his father, and he told him what he had seen and what he knew. His father stopped him, Walker said. He grabbed me by the chest. He drove me right up against the wall and said, Now you listen to me, son. You will never, ever tell anybody this story again. Do you understand me? You will not tell your mother, your brothers, or your friends. And of all people, you're not going to say anything to the police. Do you understand me? He said, you know, I was shocked and I said, sure, of course, you know, I was going to obey my father, but I didn't understand it because my dad was always a law and order, right and wrong kind of guy. And I never understood it. Years go by and it would come to my mind. I would think about that. And I didn't know what to think about what my dad said. When I was 18, I enlisted in the Marine Corps and I thought, okay, I'm a man now. I'm going to confront my father. And he asked him, why did he react this way? He said his father, who was also named Bob Walker, Bob Walker Sr., said he answered very clearly, you know, son, at the time when you told me that story, I recognized that you could have shown motive and intent for what Doris Duke did. I was concerned that you as a key witness could have been doing your paper route on the Ocean Drive some late afternoon, and a truck could have come up from behind you. The life of my child was more precious to me than that woman on Bellevue Avenue, and that's why I acted the way I did. So he thought, you know, I'm protecting my child. This woman has more money than God and looks like the police force on her side and they could take out my kid if they know he saw anything, which makes sense to me. But meanwhile, Bob Walker did tell some other people in his lifetime. He told a couple of his friends who were Marine buddies when he was younger, when he was still in his early adulthood or teens, late teens. When Bob Walker heard about the book, Peter Lance's book, Homicide at Rough Point, and read it, he said, I have to talk to him. I have to tell him and I have to tell people what I know. Lance then put all this information together and spoke to a detective with Newport Police on August 2nd, just this year. And this is in this article. The detective told him, quote, I can confirm that what he told you of his accounts of the incident on October 7th, 1966 are the same accounts of what he told me, the detective said in a statement. Mr. Walker did give me the same names you listed in your email, names of the people he has told his story to in the past. I have spoken to most of these parties who have confirmed what Mr. Walker told me. Therefore, I find Mr. Walker's account of the incident on October 7th, 1966 credible. She also concludes her message to Peter Lance saying, quote, I am now assigned to follow up with this case and it's not going to be ignored. This case is now open for further review. So that just happened. So this is the breaking news on this case from 1966. See, sometimes Once Upon a Crime does some things that are breaking news, like we just did with Robert Durst last time. So this is exciting. Let's just close this out because that was a lot and I thought it was so fascinating. Go find these articles. Go get that book. I will be talking about it more on Patreon if you want to join, I'll tell you about that at the end, but let's do this first. Just to close that Doris Duke, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the end of her life as well on Patreon, but I will say she had an interesting life and there was a bit of karma there at the end, possibly. And like I said, I'll talk about that on Patreon. But what I will tell you is this, Doris Duke died on October 28th, 1993 at the age of 80 after a series of plastic surgery and a knee surgery. It looks like what happened is she choked on some food, but she was also on high doses of morphine after the recovery for these surgeries. And they believe that contributed to her death. No autopsy was performed and she was cremated within 24 hours. When she died, the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation was worth $1.2 billion. She left the majority of the fortune, properties, and art to her foundation worth now $1.8 billion. Grants from that foundation have been given to three museums and centers on property owned by Duke in Honolulu, in Hillsborough, New Jersey, and also at Rough Point, Newport, Rhode Island. You can see her art collections. She has one of the country's largest indoor botanical gardens in New Jersey. Her foundation also doles out grants to support medical research. It was active over the years in providing grants for AIDS research. And like I said, a lot of other charities that were important to her during her life. You can go visit Rough Point. The 49-room mansion was deeded to the Newport Restoration Society in 1999 and opened to the public for tours beginning in 2000 and you can tour the property. 
So if you're interested in that, if you happen to be in Rhode Island or you're taking a road trip out there, I, I think it would be interesting to see. That is it for now, you guys. I hope you found that story as fascinating as I did. But for now, that will do it for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. And let me know what you think. Do you think Doris Duke got away with murder? Does Lance's investigation convince you that she should have been held criminally responsible? You can connect with me and let me know your thoughts by following the show on Twitter at Upon a Crime and Facebook and Instagram at Once Upon a Crime Pod. We also, let you know, we have a YouTube channel, a Pinterest page, and I've just started a TikTok channel. There's one video there. <laughs> there may be two by the time you hear this, but there's one video there uh, that you can watch and I'm working on some others. Follow us on TikTok. Find links to all of our social media in the show notes or at the Once Upon a Crime website, which is truecrimepodcast.com. Like I said, this story has so many twists and turns that I went down more than a few rabbit holes while doing the research. One of them has led me to a side story associated with the Doris Duke case. What happened to Doris Duke's billions is another unbelievable story. So she left only two heirs, the children of her nephew, Walter Inman, and although they were set to inherit more than a billion dollars, their childhood story is one filled with abuse and neglect. You won't want to miss this bonus story. I believe I'm going to do that on video on Patreon. Also for Patreon members, I'll have a bonus episode for this series coming out this month as well. I'll tell the story of the member of a rock band who was at the height of his fame when his out-of-control drinking led to the tragic death of a friend. You'll find out if his fame and fortune also helped him to get away with murder. If you'd like to become a Patreon member for bonus episodes and other perks, go to patreon.com slash what's about a crime to find out more. Thank you so much. But also, if you're not a Patreon member, don't worry. There's still one more case I'll be covering in this series, Getting Away With Murder, for all listeners this month. That episode will be released on Monday, August 30th, and you can listen everywhere for free on your favorite podcast app. Once Upon a Crime is written, produced, and edited by me, Esther Ludlow. Thanks for listening, and until next time, be good to one another. <laughs>